Hey, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Nevin Gusak, your host of the uh, Populist Patriot. It's been a while. Uh, been rather busy, but uh, now we're uh, back on track and we have some exciting guests um, that I'm setting up, uh, been setting up recently. And we have uh, Mr. Uh, David Pine here with us, and he's going to be talking about uh, issues regarding China, Russia, his perspective on the war in Ukraine, as well as uh, what we need to do as a country to defend ourselves against a possible or it seems like probable attack by the Sino-Russian axis. And uh, I'd like to thank David for his time uh, <clears throat> for joining us on the show. Welcome, David. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for appearing on The Populist Patriot. Well, I wanted to first uh, talk about your background. You had served in the U.S. military, uh, tank warfare. You served abroad. You've also served uh, on the EMP Commission, and I think we should definitely touch upon EMP. Um, so could you describe to the guests uh, a bit about your military and academic background and your work in promoting civil and national defense. Yeah, you bet. So I'm a former U.S. Army M1A1 tanker, uh, just served about three years. Uh, then uh, a few years later, I, I was uh, uh, worked as a civilian on the U.S. Army headquarters staff. I was in charge of um, working at a GS-14 uh, position with uh, lieutenant colonels. Um, and uh, I was uh, over uh, the uh, armistice cooperation with former Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, uh, Americas, and Africa. So pretty, pretty broad country desk uh, portfolio. Um, after that, I worked as uh, U.S. Senator Mike Lee's um, National Security Policy Director, I organized a military advisory committee considering consisting of uh, retired colonels and brigadier generals that I recruited uh, to serve on the committee, and. Uh, of course, I talked to him a lot about EMP issues at the time. Um, then in 2018, I became the uh, Utah State Director for the EMP Task Force. And then two years later, I was uh, promoted to Deputy Director for National Operations at the, um, for the National EMP Task Force. So uh, that's, uh, that's a little, some of my background. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you for your service and <clears throat> for our country. And on top of that, also, uh, the EMP is a huge, huge issue. Um, for the audience's sake, for those of us who don't know what EMP is, what does the ad acronym stand for, and why is the EMP issue so significant? So EMP stands for ele uh, Electromagnetic Pulse. Um, we first uh, discovered, as a country, um, the EMP threat um, at, the, at the Starfish Prime test which was conducted in the Pacific in 1963. Uh, that point, uh, even though it was, I think, hundreds of miles away from Hawaii, uh, the uh, power, it was an airburst, of course, and it shut shut off, uh, turned off the traffic lights and uh, killed the power in, in, uh, in Hawaii. Um, so that was an effect that we, um, we weren't aware of. Uh, Russia has since released uh, similar tests from um, from their nuclear testing area following the collapse of the Soviet Union that um, revealed even more widespread uh, EMP effects uh, with a much larger uh, nuclear detonation. Um, it's important because uh, EMP events can occur in, in one of two ways. Uh, it can be a, a, a man-made event as in an EMP attack, uh, which would be delivered with a, a super EMP weapon, which is essentially a nuclear weapon that's been specially enhanced for EMP um, effects. And that is a technology Russia developed uh, during the 1990s and subsequently shared with both communist China and North Korea. And then, uh, so that that is a threat that may or may not develop, although, I mean, given uh, the way the, the Biden administration has been moving against Russia and China, um, you know, the likelihood of that has gone way up. And then uh, there is uh, the, uh, the threat of uh, super geo geomagnetic storms from the sun, uh, we had a Carrington event in 1859, which uh, uh, fried all our te the telegraph lines and, and wires and uh, actually burned telegraph uh, operators. And we have a much more sophisticated uh, and vulnerable, um, you know, of course, electronic uh, system today. 
so the effects would be uh, far, far worse of, of a, a keratin uh, global uh, EMP event. So it's not a question of if, but when. And so the, uh, the task force on national and homeland security, our mission is to uh, inform the public, uh, to meet with uh, state legislators and members of Congress to uh, get them to fund um, grid hardening, hardening the grid against EMP and cyber attack, as well as other uh, critical infrastructure. Well, and let me just add also the Russians, the China, I think you touched upon it, the Russians, the Chinese and the Iranians, uh, all in their military newspapers, even some public statements and threats have indicated that they would use EMP against the United States um, for, you know, various different reasons or rather real or, or alleged transgressions uh, against their countries by the United States. So they're deadly serious about it. And of course, there's concerns about North Korea also developing weapons with the, you know, exploding an EMP uh, air burst over the United States too as well. And of course, Japan. Um, and EMP attacks have been also just for the audience's sake. They have been in some of our popular uh, cinema movie culture, the series Jericho. If you remember that, that portrayed an EMP attack against the United States. And, you know, one of the things, and I'll have uh, uh, Dr. Pry or Mr. Pry, or what was your rank, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, if I recall correctly? I mean, did you want me to call you <laughs> Dr. Pry? <Yeah>. Or <laughs> no, I, I was a Lieutenant Colonel equivalent on, on the civilian side, on the Army headquarters staff, but I was only a Lieutenant in the Army. Well, you were, you, you, know, you earned it, though. I'm very proud of that. So anyway, um, and one of the um, things I remember about Jericho when watching that series was, at least in the temporary, a complete uh, devolution of the United States and a collapse of law and order, and ultimately the breakup of the United States too, as well into separate countries. Do you, th in your opinion, and I know you've worked with the late great uh, Peter William, uh, Peter Vincent Pry, who's an expert on uh, the S uh, Soviet nuclear strategy. What are, what would the effects of an EMP attack against the United States? Has that been studied? And then of course, my follow-up question is, why hasn't any Democratic or Republican presidential administrations or Democratic or Republican-led Congress have not taken this seriously? I mean, in my opinion, Mitch McConnell, you know, he's handing things to, the, of course, was is a populist channel, not a conservative, Reagan conservative channel. You know, Mitch McConnell is like lifting 10 weights to appease his globalist corporate donors in the Federalist Society for all these Supreme Court justices that are against American labor, for stateless corporations and everything else, but nothing is being done about EMP. So what are the effects of an EMP attack that the commission that you served on this study and why hasn't anything been done about it? Well, first let me say I, I did not serve on the EMP, uh, Congressional EMP Commission. Um, I'm serving on a congressionally authorized board, uh, which is also a nonprofit, which uh, was set up by the um, the uh, Congressional EMP Caucus, the House EMP Caucus. So uh, that's how we originated. So we it's we're kind of a spinoff from uh, you know the Congressional EMP Caucus was kind of almost a spinoff from the Congressional EMP Commission, mm -hmm. which did most of its work by 2008, uh, and then was recommissioned briefly uh, until 2017. Um, but then, uh, yeah, we were we were uh, authorized by uh, the uh, House uh, Congressional EMP Commission or EMP Caucus. Um, but in terms of effects on um, on uh, America, I mean, it, it would be absolutely catastrophic. It would uh, destroy uh, society. Uh, EMP is, as uh, Dr. Pry uh, stated, is a technological weapon that would kind of blast us back 150 years in technology to the late 19th century pre-electronic age. And, uh, you know, we would lose, um, I mean, all cars would be uh, non-functional other than cars, uh, uh, you know, from the 70s and before. Uh, we would have, uh, you know, our food distribution system would break down, power, communications, internet would be knocked out. I mean, the entire economy would, would 
would be gone, <laughs> wouldn't just crash, it would essentially cease to exist. We would have a, a barter economy. Uh, the US dollar would, you know, would uh, lose all its value essentially. Um, and uh, we would, uh, you know, even though even water, I mean, running off water would be gone as well. So we would, um, society would break down very quickly within a uh, period of a few weeks um, where, you know, citizens would be fighting each other, family against family, just to, um, you know, to survive uh, and, and try to get the, the last scraps of food and water available, especially in the urban areas. I mean, not so much in the rural areas, I think in rural areas, um, you would uh, see a lot more cooperation because the uh, the food supplies would be sufficient to sustain the rural population. Uh, where in some cases, um, uh, you know, the uh, number of cattle, for example, is is exceeds the number the, the number of people. Um, so th that's a good place to 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 ride out in the EAP, uh, EAP event. Uh, but then. Uh, what we would see is the depopulation of America uh, between uh, up to 90 percent. So that's uh, about uh, 270 plus uh, American Americans that could perish from an EMP attack within a year. Uh, they would die from mass starvation, starvation related or malnutrition related diseases, and of course civil strife, uh, which would be on a, on a level we've never seen before. I mean, it would be uh, a second American civil war but there wouldn't be two sides. There would be, as you mentioned, there um, the United States could break break apart into, I mean, as as few as five pieces. It it could could be, uh, you know, three hundred pieces for all we know in terms of you know kind of city states situ uh, situation. So uh, the bottom line is the U.S. would cease to exist as a nation, um, and uh, population would would be greatly uh, reduced. Um, very horrifically, and then we would be uh, we would be completely uh, vulnerable to uh, enemy occupation. So uh, the most likely thing that would occur would be uh, Russia would occupy some parts of the of the East Coast. Um, I don't think they would place a high priority on going inland, uh, probably just population centers. And then um, uh, China would would likely occupy much of the Western U.S., which they talked about. Um, as, as you're familiar with, uh, in 2005, they in a, a leaked uh, uh, leaked quotes from the then, then um, Defense Minister of China, I think it was uh, Xi Haoxin, uh, talked about uh, wanting to, de to depopulate um, uh, the U.S. by about two thirds, and then they would uh, bring in a couple hundred million Chinese uh, uh, colonists to to uh, create a new China, quote unquote, new China led by the CCP. So uh, that would be absolutely devastating. Yeah, no, and the occupation the, you touched upon there, the Red Dawn, it is real. And in addition, there was a defector and he was not really taken as seriously as he should have been. And this was during the Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush and Clinton administrations, Colonel Stanislav Lunev of the Russian GRU. And he uh, discussed this with J.R. Nyquist and other venues too. Uh, he's touched upon it publicly. And the Soviet war plan during the Cold War until 1991 was for the Soviets to occupy the United States after a selective nuclear strike to take out command and control. Under the Yeltsin administration, that was reworked apparently in early 1992 in a meeting with the Russian general staff, as he told of it. And he said that the Russians would occupy Alaska which is something that they always talked about taking back, according to at least two defectors from the Soviet and Czechoslovakian militaries during the Cold War. They would re-annex Alaska, take port of Canada, um, <clears throat> but they would use their missiles to decapitate the federal government here in the United States. And then the Chinese PLA would take the lower 48. Um, and then various allies of Russia and China at the time would occupy the United States as well and they would take various uh, goods and materials as uh, looting rights, as Luna have termed it. And the speech by General Chi Hao Shin of the Central Military Commission uh, in the People's Republic of China, he made an allusion to the great power and agreement with the great power in the North uh, that um, they would give parts of the United States as well uh, to them, meaning their Russian ally. 
Um, you know, it's the position, my position, um, and you can comment on it if you'd like, uh, that the Sino-Soviet split from 1960 until 1989 was vastly exaggerated by our American policymakers. And if you'd like, uh, David, I'd send you parts of my latest book, Turning the Page, where I have a couple of pages that really devote to this. There's too many, too much information on cooperation between Beijing and Moscow from 1960 to 1989 that really shows that really the split at best was exaggerated by American policymakers. Um, at worst, as alleged by uh, Major Anatoly Galitsyn, KGB major defected 1961 and elements of the CIA claimed it was a strategic deception. And we know that the split was healed at the Gorbachev Deng Xiaoping summit in 1989. Um, and in fact, there were even documents like the West, they were afraid that the United States would be afraid that they were teaming up again. And they had in their internal documents, they said in a very artful way, you know, we got to tip off the United States to let them know that this summit is not meant against any third country or anything. But there's a little bit of evidence that shows that that's not quite true because there were terminology in the Chinese and Soviet press at the time that talked about creating a new world political order in 1989, the two powers. And then by about 1990, 1991, there were reports in the mainstream press of open military cooperation and then an open intelligence agreement between the GRU and the Chinese PLA military intelligence. J. Michael Waller, I believe, was uh, in one of his books on uh, post-Soviet Russian intelligence operations, is one of the individuals that has documented this, and I talk about it in my latest book as well. Um, in your opinion, what's your estimation of the power of the Sino-Russian alliance? Can it defeat the United States? But actually, before we go back, other than a few good Republicans here and there, why hasn't the most of the Democratic and Republican leadership haven't done anything about the EMP before we go into Red Dawn? So um, there have been a, a couple of efforts, uh, that, uh, the first of which made uh, substantial progress. Uh, it was called the GRID Act in 2010 and passed the House unanimously uh, under Nancy Pelosi. And then it was killed in the Ener Senate Energy Committee by uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski, who wanted to substitute uh, you know, some of the climate change and environmental crap that um, you know, she's championed. Um, yeah, that really has no bearing on national security. And that was a real travesty because that was a moment where we could have passed it unanimously in the Senate as well, and we could have um, at least partially funded, perhaps not fully funded, um, EMP hardening of, the, of our electrical grid. Um, and then in 2013, there was uh, um, uh, the SHIELD Act. Unfortunately, that didn't get out of committee um, in the House. So um, then we had SEPA in 2017 that, that um, you know, implemented some of the recommendations of the uh, EMP task force, but not the most important, which was grid hardening. So um, then the, the Trump passed a, an executive order. He was the most, uh, he was the only president really who's done anything on the EMP issue and recognized it as a threat. Um, and he uh, had a really good executive order, but as president, of course, he didn't have any legislative uh, authority to authorize uh, funding. So um, we've, you know, we've been lobbying, um, members of Congress, and um, I have a couple, at least one or two uh, that have committed to, uh, you know, to sponsor a bill and they just haven't done it. It's just not really a priority. And uh, some of those same folks are, are now supporting the war in Ukraine against Russia, which is uh, maximizing the chances of uh, nuclear EMP attack, both against the U.S. and its allies. So, uh, you know, we're facing a, a real, a real threat. And um, a lot of it is, you know, it's real a real de dereliction of duty that uh, that members of Congress and and past presidents, including uh, our current president, have, have done uh, little to nothing. Again, with the exception of Trump, who, who did everything he possibly could uh, to protect the American people against DMP attack, 
given that it's it's been 60 years that we've known about this threat. And um, it all stems from uh, the mentality, I think, of uh, that was prevalent of, uh, with the ABM Treaty that was uh, passed and uh, was signed in 1972 with the, so the former Soviet Union, in, in which we basically made a decision by 75 to dismantle our, our missile national missile defense system. With then with this, uh, the safeguard system, we had uh, the Sprint uh, ABM, which was uh, the most technologically advanced ABM in the world with uh, neutron warheads. Uh, that likely would have proved very effective in defending the U.S. against nuclear missile attack. Um, and uh, we closed down our civil defense system. So Ru Russia and China, as, you, as I'm sure you're aware, Russia in particular has the most uh, advanced and uh, pervasive uh, civil defense system in the world, uh, uh, a missile defense system that has 200, over 225 more uh, land-based ABMs than we have. Um, and of course, nuclear uh, su uh, supremacy along with China uh, over the U.S. in terms of having uh, around five times more nuclear, nuclear warheads than we do. So uh, yeah, we're, we're in a world of hurt in that situation. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the Red Dawn situation, you know, it is really interesting because Red Dawn, uh, the 2012 version, uh, did have an EMP, EMP strike. It wasn't totally accurate because uh, all of the cars seemed to work after the EMP attack, but it did knock out communications and paralyzed our military uh, forces so that we effectively lost control of the entire West Coast to China and North Korea, which I think is pretty realistic. Um, following an EMP attack, I think within, within a few weeks or possibly a few months, our military would melt away as they realized their families were starving and, and being, um, you know, uh, attacked and, and perhaps even killed, uh, you know, for their food supplies. Um, so our, we would have very little defenses. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we have 400, 400 million firearms in the country, but when everyone's trying, everyone would essentially be fighting each other, you know, uh, not everyone, but um, in the urban centers, of course, um, to, uh, you know, fighting, fighting enough gains and, and trying to just preserve and protect their lives. They wouldn't really be ready uh, to defend the, the country against a foreign invader. So, um, you know, there's so much that, ne that needs to be done. Uh, we are, we need to have, uh, and hopefully we can talk about this more, we need to have uh, a diplomatic offensive with Russia and China. We need to uh, improve relations with Russia so we can uh, divide and disrupt the, uh, the Sino-Russian alliance, which I've been advocating since 2000, um, seven months after I, uh, I uh, called for that in my oral thesis at Georgetown in, in my master's program in national security studies. Uh, of course, uh, Russia and China did become formal military allies. And uh, they, they actually, you know, uh, the, the globalists have, have finally had to admit that the Russia and China are military allies uh, with their uh, declaration of a, a no limits partnership in February of 2022. Well, it's interesting, and I wanted to, at least part of the show, discuss, and I think you're referring to some years ago, your National Interest article, um, <clears throat> where you do call for this sort of peace, but with one eye open, because I, we and I have talked uh, offline uh, about this with Russia. Um, <clears throat> so did you want to go into your article uh, that you wrote about your thesis in uh, 2014. But before I mention that, one thing you mentioned about the globalists, the, and I term the globalists the most powerful element of the globalist cartel, as I've referred to it in print. The globalists, because of profit, I mean, Lenin talked about, you know, the selling the rope to hang themselves uh, with the old Soviet Union, with the Russian Federation, then the globalist cartel has always advocated trade and tech transfers with the Russians. In fact, the uh, reports have indicated and studies have indicated when the Russian weapons were captured and taken apart, you found all sorts of components from the West, from various advanced Asian countries, the United States, China, we don't even have to go over how the United States and West Germany, later Germany, France, etc., Japan has beefed up the Chinese PLA, not to mention the Russians during part of the Cold War and then in the early 19, from 1990 onwards. So I wanted to add that in about the globalists. The globalists are very schizophrenic when it comes to policy. 
they'll say, well, let's have a big military, our neoconservative friends will say, I say that friends sarcastically, but yet they want to build this huge military with all these adventures all over the world on imported parts with rocket engines from China and and rare earths from, uh, no, rocket engines from Russia and rare earths from China. So I had to get that in there. But talk about why did you think, um, come across this idea or come to believe this idea that we need to have a sort of cautious peace with Russia and kind of disengage from these uh, tense relations with Moscow, Beijing. You talk about spheres of influence. Um, I know you're not an ally of Putin, contrary to what the Ukrainian uh, information ministry or board or whatever, counter disinformation board uh, has submitted. I think there are varying currents in the anti-war opinion that are not necessarily pro-Putin, like I love Putin and Putin is not this would-be aggressor um, or geopolitical rival. So what made you come to this train of thought? Well, it's been over a period of time, uh, but it really, you know, it began, I began brainstorming. You know, I, I first wrote on uh, the Sino-Russian threat in 1995, 1996. 1996 is really when they became allies with their uh, strategic partnership, but it wasn't formal until 2001 uh, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, founding. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just a matter of brainstorming how to divide uh, the Sino-Russian alliance and split it apart. And, uh, you know, obviously, um, aligning or having a strategic partnership with China was out of the question. I'm a lifelong anti-communist. You know, I, I uh, my formative years were during the Cold War, uh, much as I assume uh, your own were, your, uh, yours were as well. So, uh, and I even wrote, uh, you know, I, I wrote back in 1986, I uh, never published, of course, but I uh, talked about uh, a treaty of peace with the Soviet Union, which they, they would withdraw all their troops from uh, Eastern Europe um, and, uh, uh, you know, let all of, all of the constituent uh, uh, Soviet republics become independent and liberalized in various other levels. And that actually came to pass five and a half years later. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I, I look back at my writing and, and my writings previously, and I think it was probably around 2003, I, I made an abortive attempt to, to found my own think tank and when I lived in DC, and it was called the Center for the National Security Interest. Um, and uh, I, I published kind of a forecast and, and kind of a, a national security strategy on how we could accomplish that. And uh, one of the, uh, the elements of that was to uh, forge a kind of a grand bargain with, with Russia in which we would um, kind of have a mutual security agreement in which we would uh, recognize their legitimate security concerns uh, without conceding um, you know, any of our own, essentially. And uh, that uh, developed further in 2009 and then again, and then in 2019 with my sphere of influence proposal that you referenced, subsequently published um, in the National Interest two years later. Initially, it was on World Net Daily. Um, and that is, uh, I've since refined that and, it, and uh, you know, it's really would come at no, uh, little to no cost to us. I mean, obviously, we couldn't, uh, you know, Ukraine's not an ally, so we shouldn't be, be involved in that at all, um, other than to, you know, to try to bring that war to uh, a rapid end as quickly as possible to avoid a, a, a likely Russian nuclear escalation. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the Pacific, uh, we'd just, just be uh, recognizing that we, we would not defend Taiwan militarily. Uh, we'd want to come to some kind of understanding of the Korean Peninsula uh, in which, uh, you know, North Korea would agree to uh, uh, either destroy its own uh, super EMP satellites that threaten the U.S. Uh, with uh, uh, EMP destruction or else allow us to shoot them down uh, and also to uh, destroy their nuclear facility in exchange for U.S. military withdrawal from uh, South Korea uh, and perhaps signing a peace treaty. Uh, with North Korea and formally ending the Korean War. Uh, but then uh, in terms of other or other alliances, you know, we would re uh, retain our troops in Japan, probably Australia, um, and we would uh, continue our uh, 
alliance agreements with uh, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and uh, uh, New Zealand, which we really don't really have much of a security. We have no active security agreement with them at, at this point because they, they've kind of withdrawn from it. Um, so that the, uh, it wouldn't really give up anything and it could achieve a lot because uh, what it would do is it would replace the current bipolar uh, international order with a tripolar international order in which Russia and China would no longer be allies. Uh, we would essentially neutralize their military alliance uh, and then we would um, accommodate them. Uh, China, of course, with uh, Taiwan and, and uh, Southeast Asia, um, the South China Sea, Mongolia, all of those uh, you know territories would be recognized as their sphere of influence. Uh, Russia would have the former Soviet Union, um, accepting, of course, the the three uh, Baltic republics, which are would remain part of NATO, and then the U.S. would be able to expel under the agreement. We would expel um, uh, Chinese influence, uh, military influence from uh, South America. Uh, they would have to, you know, withdraw all their troops, uh, relinquish control of the Panama Canal. So we would have, uh, we would be able to reestablish the Monroe Doctrine, uh, even while. Uh, you know, Cuba uh, and Nicaragua and Venezuela could continue to receive uh, Chinese economic aid. Uh, they would be cut off from all military support, uh, you know, with no Russian or Chinese troops. And we could reestablish re more dominance um, in, in the Western Hemisphere, which, of course, is our most vital national security interest. Uh, and then retain a, a nuclear umbrella over uh, Western Europe, as well as um, uh, our Pacific allies. But in terms of Eastern Europe, um, that those countries would essentially become uh, almost second tier NATO members. They'd remain part of NATO, but would they we would uh, not have uh, our nuclear umbrella protecting them. Uh, and we would withdraw um, our, our troops and Western NATO troops from Eastern Europe in exchange for a, a similar withdrawal uh, of Russian troops from Belarus and Ukraine. So that's essentially uh, what the, what the, my sphere of influence proposal uh, would accomplish. Yeah, interesting. Um, my questions is is what what was the core uh, thing or I don't want to say come to Jesus moment, so to speak, that made you think, oh my God, this is what we have to do. Where I guess I would come from, you know. You know, I would, to a degree, give support to Taiwan or Ukraine to a degree. I put a three asterisk there because I'm not for NATO expansion eastward because, in my opinion, it would give the Russians an excuse for something that they've been preparing for decades upon decades, whether under the red flag or the blue, red and white flag of the Russian Federation, which is ultimately bringing down the United States. Um, you know, with Taiwan, my only concern is once Taiwan is taken, whether peace through PRC subversion, which the Chinese engage in, as well as their active military plans, they take Taiwan, that's going to affect our supply chain even more with our Taiwan's export of computer chips, of uh, the microchips. Um, that is a concern of mine. Where I would, where I could have some buy-in to what you're saying and recommending is this notion, in my view, that the United States, American power, we like to think we're strong. And look, I love this country as much as you do, but I think we have a lot of hubris and where we believe we think it's still 1945, where we have a monopoly on everything. And we don't. When we take a look at the literature, I've read the studies as you had, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. National Guard, major issues with training, with supply, the forever wars have not helped. You remember those reports dated from 2007 and 2008, mind you. You have recent media articles which talks about massive problems recruiting American troops. You have the issues as far back as 1987, you had General Wickham, you may remember this, where he famously said, and it was reported in Washington Post, where he said the United States could only fight 
a prolonged war with the Soviet Union at the time for maybe no more than three months. And then otherwise we don't, he said, we did not have the industrial capability to supply our troops. You also have a lot of people in this country, and you and I may disagree on this. I mean, we both agree that many of our young people, Democratic voters, are embracing socialism. I mean, who knows what that could mean, because that could mean like 50,000 things. And you and I would agree that's not a good thing, but I think that's a product of real demoralization with corruption in our government, with a perceived lack of representation. So you have this internal demoralization. You also have, as you've talked about, there are certain uh, elements of our defense sector that we've ignored. Our nuclear fissile material and our Minutemen are almost past its shelf life. That's something I believe that actually Dr. Pry and others have warned about. Um, and things of that nature, our shipbuilding industry, our merchant marine capability is gone because President Reagan removed the subsidies in 1981. And that started a spiral downhill with our shipyard industries. Our steel industry is not what it was. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on where we also import uh, materials, including man important manufactured articles from China and even Russia, which we shouldn't do, especially products that we could produce here in the United States. So my view is, is that we do need to buy some time. And I think that was perhaps the motivation of why you wrote it. And if I remember, the Russians and the Chinese kind of saw through that and they didn't like what you wrote. They knew where you were coming from. That's the thing. And I think that's where maybe the Ukrainians don't realize you're thinking you want to rebuild this country. And that's the thing. It's like this is going to require a it's going to require massive spending to get our house in order. And I think we have to really work on renewing our industrial and military and intelligence power. And we also have to, uh, we have to really have good leaders, warrior aristocracy, as uh, some of the old school conservatives will call it, uh, back in our government that truly care about the people and the people's interest and really kind of um, rule by, govern by example, and give people, average working class people, because it's a populist program, uh, a working, our working class, our poor, our middle class, a sense that they have a stake in this country, a say in our government. And that's where I kind of understand where you're coming from. My only concern is, is I don't see the Russians and Chinese abiding by agreements. They view agreements just like, uh, you know, other totalitarian or authoritarian expansionist states as pieces of paper to be used and then discarded when needed. It kind of reminded me of what Hitler said in Augsburg in a speech in 1934. He's like, yes, let's talk about peace all that we want and peace treaties, but as long as it serves Germany's interest, essentially. Um, so, <clears throat> and that's my only concern there, but so what is the true motivation really? Cause I don't see you and I think a lot of people, and unfortunately I've seen it from time to time on your Facebook, you'll see people on your page, like saying, well, you're a Putin lover and you're a Russia lover and, and this and that, 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 that and everything else. And I look at it and I'm like, well, I might not agree with Mr. with P, uh, Peter, excuse me, David on certain nuances, but I get where he's coming from. Now, is it true that the Russian and Chinese knew about your spheres of influence writings? I don't think they liked it too much. Can you tell me about a little bit about their reaction, or am I is my brain the cobweb clearing here? Am I? You're absolutely right. So that yeah, when I published that, uh, it, it did go viral in, internationally. Uh, it was uh, I, there's a think tank in in Russia, which apparently is uh, one of the biggest uh, or think tanks that's closest to the Kremlin thinking. And the name escapes me right now. But uh, so I published that back in September and October of 2021, and. Uh, the response from Russia was essentially, uh, you know, it has some things we like, you know, in terms of the sphere of influence, but uh, we will never break our alliance with China because that's what has got us to this stage where we're on the verge of, you know, of this massive victory over the U.S. 
uh, even if it doesn't go to war, you know, just where they've reached this uh, nuclear supremacy over us and their, their alliance with China was, was kind of key to them having economic, uh, you know, military, technological and um, other areas of uh, superior over us in terms of having the, the largest ground forces, the largest Navy and, and whatnot. Uh, and then China was was the same way. China seemed a little bit more interested, but then they concluded this is a trap. You know, China will not be fooled. That was the title of their article. Yes. China will not be fooled for that. <laughs> uh, by this this proposal. And you know, I wasn't I wasn't trying to like hide the objectives. You know, I was very clear. I'm like, this is this is to promote U.S. national security. Uh, our I stated in 2000 in my oral thesis at Georgetown that uh, you know the fundamental um, U.S. national security policy and strategy had to be to divide and disrupt the Sino-Russian alliance. There's been no attempt to do that. There's been no attempt to uh, to make peace with Russia. That's that was really the uh, one of the foremost priorities of Dr. Pry uh, in the last eight or nine months of, it, of his his life. Uh, being the hero that he was, and he he pro actually assigned me a special mission of trying to to do that through my articles to try to sow distrust between Russia and China, uh, and also to promote uh, you know a peace with Russia. Um, and he he viewed Russia as a, as a natural strategic uh, partner against China. Uh, I don't believe, uh, and he 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 was realistic uh, as I am, you know. We're never going to become allies with Russia, but we, uh, as strategic partners, we can ne effectively neutralize their uh, military alliance with, with China. And when I say that, I mean that if we were to find ourselves at war with China, uh, but we had already accommodated Russia in terms of, you know, a sphere of influence or something along those lines, it wouldn't have to be a formal agreement, basically just a withdrawal, you know, a, a normalization of diplomatic and trade ties and a withdrawal of forces from Eastern Europe, um, they most likely would not join the war against the United States. And that's really the key is we neutralize the Russian nuclear threat through diplomatic means. And then we, at the same time, uh, we make the chances of Chinese aggression, you know, against us uh, less likely, uh, thus helping to neutralize the Chinese threat. Because together, they're unstoppable. You know, we can't. There's no way we can possibly defeat them. Um, but if if Russia were even a neutral power uh, in in a kind of a Sino-American rivalry, uh, that would uh, that would benefit us extremely at the strategic level. Uh, but in term, you know, this really it, it, it is about buying time. It's about buying time to to triple the size of our nuclear deterrent to uh, build 5,000 ABMs, including space-based elements, to harden all of our critical infrastructure, not just the grid against uh, EMP and cyber attack, uh, essentially, you know, um, both deterring those, you know, those types of modes of attack, but also, um, uh, you know, ensuring that we could, we would survive an EMP or, or a cyber attack or a nuclear mm -hmm. missile attack. Um, but it's also it's all about, also about really forging uh, a, a great power piece and a nuclear piece that's long lasting. You know, the Yalta Agreement. I, you know, there's no greater critic of the Yalta Agreement than I I am than myself. I've all, I've long criticized Churchill as one of the greatest appeasers of evil and uh, evil dictators in in world history. Only Truman uh, was more of an appeaser. Uh, FDR, arguably. In giving up Eastern Europe to, to the Soviets, uh, which you know, we're talking eleven different nations or parts of nations, uh, eight different uh, Eastern European nations uh, were uh, annexed either in part or in full by the Soviets, with uh, you know, essentially the tacit or full support of, of uh, FDR and, and Churchill. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that. Churchill's idea of dividing Europe uh, with an Iron Curtain, which he proposed to Stalin in October um, 1944 at the, at the Fourth Mo Moscow Conference, uh, was really, it was, um, you know, from an it, from a amoral perspective, it was a very wise concept, and it, it kept the new, it kept the great power nuclear peace for 54 years, uh, where neither side violated the agreement. 
Uh, so, it, you know, you talk about how Russia can't be trusted to keep its agreements. Well, as you, you yourself stated, and as was the case with Nazi Germany, uh, they will keep agreements which they view in their national interest. And this, uh, this agreement would be very much in Russia's national interest to keep. So I think it would be enduring. I think it would establish uh, a lasting peace. It would it would uh, be a force multiplier in terms of um, you know protecting the U.S. against nuclear, EMP, and, and cyber attack. Because ultimately, and here's some here's a uh, this may be something you you, you don't agree on. Uh, Russia and China don't want they don't want war with us. Uh, that's kind of their plan B. They will absolutely go to war with us if we uh, confront them militarily over Ukraine or Taiwan uh, with uh, direct military, you know, military forces, uh, and they will do so with North Korea. So, if we fight Russia and expect that that we'll be able to fight them alone, not only will that go to the nuclear, EMP, and cyber level, uh, and inevitably within a few weeks, we'll be fighting North Korea and China at the same time. Uh, by the same, you know, by the same fashion, if we were to fight China over Taiwan, uh, it would be guaranteed that Russia and North Korea would join the fight, a direct war against the U.S. as well. So we really don't want to be fighting three uh, enemy nuclear powers when, uh, you know, essentially they're, as an alliance, they have uh, nuclear supremacy over us and will for the foreseeable future unless we follow, uh, you know, my recommendation for mobilizing our, our 2,000 strategic uh, warheads that we have in reserve that would take six to 24 months uh, to redeploy. Yeah, I mean, my, I, would, I would disagree with the characterization of Russia and China. They, you know, they are gearing up for war, certainly as an option. Are they going to merely pursue war? They'll try different avenues, whether political as well as military intelligence fronts, or a combination of the three to dominate the United States. They see the United States as a um, is basically the biggest uh, impediment to their uh, desire for world domination. And I'm of the opinion and the viewpoint based on my research. And a lot of this also comes from defectors from the FSB, the SVR, China, the Russians even from their, some of their allies who've come to the United States, and they all say the Cold War hasn't ended. But I don't, where I think you and I agree is, is I think we need to concentrate on building up the United States and really pouring money into the continental defense. Um, we don't want to, see Russia is looking, and this is something I agree with J.R. Nyquist, the Russians want to justify a war. They're not going to go to war unless they can justify it well to the population or they think they can to show themselves that they're the victim of Western hegemony. Why add, and if Jeff, if you're going to watch this, correct me if I'm misquoting you, why would we do anything to throw fat on the barbecue fire in that respect? So, you know, I think to... One of my points on here on this topic is I think we need, and I think you and I can at least have common agreement, we need to concentrate not only within our hemisphere, but we have to concentrate on becoming once again the arsenal of democracy, if you will. Not that I'm saying I'm a full-blown neoconservative, I'm not, but we need to, God forbid, if we do, if we, are a victim of Russian Chinese attack, we need to be able to deflect it as much as possible. And my concern, first and foremost, if I were a senator or a congressman or a president, not that I would ever want the job, um, my, my foremost concern is, is basically formulating policy in the best interests of the American people. And we just don't have, we're just not in a position to go guns blazing. I mean, uh, I'm sure you felt the same way where Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey, when there was the Republican primary debate back in the election of 2016, he was talking about establishing Syria, a no-fly zone, and if any Russian planes violated that, that he would shoot down Russian Air Force aircraft. And that's just, to me, that's insane. I think he's living in a world where we're 1945, 
where we're the preeminent industrial and military power. So I don't know what planet he's living in. Maybe we have secret weapons somewhere in Los Alamos National Laboratories or Nellis Air Force Base, but um, I think we're more vulnerable than we think. The good news is, is we have the good human talent here to help reverse things between scientists, between political minds, strategic minds. Some of them are no longer with us, but I, I would like to believe we have those people that exist within the borders of the United States. And it's now time that we need to tap these people so we can made, make a, in, embark on a major course correction. So, um, but I think the disagreement that you and I would have is on the nature of Russia's intentions I mean, you kind of insinuated that they're not a friend, but we could use them as a card against China. My concern is, is we did that with China from 19, about 19, well, 1969, because that's when Nixon started to loosen the embargo that was imposed on China in 1950 after the PLA became involved in the Korean War. Because um, we did trade with Mao from 1949 to 1950. We didn't actually immediately slam down a total embargo until then. Um, and in fact, the Truman administration, unfortunately, actually wasn't against, was actually against the media embargo of Mao's China in 1949 until they got involved in the Korean War. But anyways, my concern is, is that still China and the Soviet Union collaborated on a whole host of fronts. Uh, diplomatically supported them on common issues that were aimed against the United States. And fundamentally, the Russian government, under Yeltsin and um, Putin especially, they have a fundamentally Soviet mindset and Soviet culture. And they will use strate what I call strategic pragmatism in order to gain the most from the West and to lull the West and the United States to sleep too as well. Um, and that's my biggest concern. And a recent book that I was reading and going through uh, was called uh, Putin's People, which really talks quite a bit about the so-called changes in the Soviet Union 1989 to 1991 and thereafter. And you have a lot of the same faces as the old wine and new bottles. So personally, for future Russia, I have no problem with a strong Russia. I mean, I'm not saying Russia shouldn't have nuclear weapons and a burgeoning industrial sector, and an independent economic base, and be a proud country. My concern is that it still hasn't divorced itself from Soviet culture. And that's not something we can necessarily impose on them. We can't just like invade Russia and say, and toss out the United Russia Party. I mean, that's insane suicide. But I think what we need to do, from my view, is we have to protect our country as best as we can against what we know about their intentions. And there's plenty of information if we choose to draw upon it. So that's my, I guess, counterpoint that, I'm, that I'd be making. But I think a lot of what you say has merit. I think if you were part of the anti-US left, in the U.S. Congress, if you were, let's say, a Congresswoman Barbara Lee, I'm sure the Chinese and the Russians would probably have a different reaction to your spheres of influence paper that you wrote for the national interest. But they didn't like it because they don't trust you because you're coming from a position that you want a strong America and militarily, industrially. And that's where it is. But my, my last question about this particular topic is, let's say, the uh, future Trump administration or Republican or Democratic administration, let's say they say, okay, uh, David, your proposal looks great. It's terrific, well-written, very logical. And let's say they do what China did. They continue to, during part of the Cold War, they continue to collaborate with the Russians and they still hit the United States with some blows even outside their spheres of influence. What would you do if the spheres of agreements fall apart and they continue to expand beyond their spheres of influence? What would be your plan B? I'm not trying to be a pain in the butt, I'm just trying to pick your mind. Well, let me first say that uh, I think there were 
the, probably the three biggest mistakes we made after the Cold War uh, is that, uh, number one, we didn't invite Russia to join NATO. That was something that Gorbachev wanted. It was something that Putin and Yeltsin also said they wanted. Um, because that, if we had done that, there would have been no sign of Russian alliance. Uh, Russia is an enemy because our policies have made them an enemy. Um, obviously, they were a, a you know, an uh, unredeemable enemy like communist China uh, in the Soviet days. But following the Soviet collapse, there was an opportunity for us to uh, become partners or even allies with with Russia. And we could have been military allies against China. I really believe that that uh, we could have done that. And in an I ideal world, I, I think that's something that uh, we sh we could still do today. Unfortunately, that's completely unrealistic. Um, and an alliance of the you know the two greatest nuclear superpowers on the planet, although China may have exceeded us by this point with their massive nuclear buildup, uh, would be unbeatable in terms of no one would mess with us. And Russia wouldn't feel the need to be invading uh, their neighbors because they'd be uh, part of, you know, uh, a grand alliance. Uh, you know, similarly, similar to what, what Churchill uh, did against Nazi Germany, because I've said repeatedly that communist China is the new, is the new Nazi Germany. But the difference is, I would have, you know, I would have fought to the death to oppose an alliance with the Soviets because they were the most murderous and genocidal power in world history at the time. And so I think that was a very evil and immoral alliance, an unholy alliance that we didn't need to do. We could have defeated Hitler uh, without a, without an alliance with, with the Soviets. And we never should have aided them militarily. That was completely unnecessary as well. And I've talked about that a lot uh, on my uh, Substack site on, at dpyne.substack.com. Um, but in terms of uh, what you, of your question, uh, you know, were there, uh, if, if uh, Russia or China were, were to violate a uh, sphere of influence agreement, it would really depend because if they were to violate it by infringing upon our sphere of influence, uh, that would, and I don't think they would ever do that. That's really the whole purpose is we have vital national security interests and then we have interests that aren't vital. And Eastern Europe has never been a vital interest that was recognized by Eisenhower and, and LBJ by refusing to intervene in Eastern Europe uh, when the Soviets were invading um, uh, Hungary, um, Czechoslovakia uh, in 68 and uh, Hungary, I think, in 53. So, um, you know, that would not be that would not be something we go to war over. Um, with regards to, you know, Chinese interference in Africa, for example, uh, further expansion in Africa or in Asian countries that were not part of our sphere of influence, we would uh, employ measures short of direct war uh, to counter that. So um, I don't think, I don't really see a scenario in which Russia and China would, if we respected their spheres of influence, I don't foresee any scenario in which they would try to infringe directly upon our own. Probably the most likely way they they might try to violate it would be if they would be by resuming uh, military assistance to, uh, for example, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. We could respond by sim by invading, simply invading and occupying all of those countries because they'd be within our sphere of influence, and they would have already pre agreed that we had the right, the sole right, to intervene militarily in areas within our spheres of influence. So um, I don't think that would that would uh, lead to uh, a world, you know, World War III with them under that, uh, under a sphere of influence agreement. But, you know, this type of agreement, interestingly, was very similar to what Trump had in mind. I don't think he, uh, he wanted a sphere of influence agreement, but he did want to have established a tripolar um, international order in which uh, Russia and China, he would make peace with Russia and we'd still have this this uh, great competition with China, and it's very unfortunate that he was impeded and prevented from establishing uh, peace with Russia. Um, you know, with the whole Trump Russia collusion, um, you know, hoax, uh, because I think he would have I think he would have succeeded, and I think that would have completely averted any Russian aggression in Eastern Europe, um, most certainly including Ukraine. Now, let's pick your mind on two more things um, before we go. Um, during this time period, let's say the sphere of influence accord 
as you laid out in the national interest. So let's say, God willing, it's successful. What would you do to re-enhance American military and industrial power? And what other reforms would you undertake? If, let's say if you're king of the United States for 10 years. <laughs> I've, often I, I've often said I could solve 80% uh, of, of our country's problems if I was dictator for six months. Uh, so uh, that's a great question. And I have a, uh, a grand strategy I proposed on my on my real real war uh, blog site about how you know what we could do to counter um, the Chinese drive to economic hegemony, which you know that's really their main strategy is uh, they don't want to take us over militarily. They want to essentially take us over economically, and they have a lot of investments to do that. So uh, you know they would lose out economically in the event uh, that we uh, went to full scale war with them. Um, but uh, that's the, really the strategy that they want to do. It's the it's the Belt and Road Initiative that they're trying to expand their economic sphere of influence to include the entire world. Right now, it doesn't include Western Europe, but it does include Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine, and, and various other Eastern European countries, and much of Latin America has joined the BRI. And so that's that's disturbing. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of in terms of uh, what my strategy would be, it would be to uh, greatly increase tariffs against Chinese goods. Uh, I have a whole list. Uh, if you haven't read it uh, so far, uh, thus far, I would strongly encourage you to read it. I think you'd, we'd find a lot, you'd find a lot of agreement with it. Um, just a lot of different uh, ways that I've been championing for, championing for many years to uh, essentially maximize our uh, industrial and manufacturing economic power uh, by, you know, severely penalizing any uh, U.S. businesses that uh, that do business in, in China, expelling all, um, you know, literally thousands of um, Chinese uh, both, uh, you know, Chinese security-owned businesses, uh, their security services, as well as PLA-owned businesses, and most importantly, to to uh, uh, repossess all of all of the land that they've taken. Uh, you know, particularly uh, the the cell towers, uh, cell tower they have in in DC, as well as the Midwest, which have the ability to disrupt uh, nuclear launch orders. I mean, it's just it's insane what what they've we've allowed them to do. Even though Congress in 2020 passed a law essentially, uh, you know, banning or or seeking to to uh, get rid of that, that Chinese uh, cell tower in DC that can disrupt nuclear launch orders, nothing has been done. I mean, it's it's outrageous. And, and uh, as as I'm sure you'd agree, it's because we have a China, uh, we have a, a president of the United States who is arguably a paid communist Chinese agent who's, you know, through his business ties, he's heavily compromised, can be blackmailed. Um, it remains to be seen whether he would fall through in his threats to, to go to war with China over, over Taiwan. I, I think it's almost, I mean, it's really impossible to see what the rationale would be that given that he's so uh, heavily invested and, and enriched by Chinese business ties that he would do that. Uh, but it's possible that he would. And so the threat of, of World War III with China uh, and Russia remain uh, with, with some of his policies. But uh, we really need to, we've got to, to uh, you know, take immediate action and urgent action to, uh, you know, to uh, throw China out of our economy, out of, out of our country, you know, um, nationalize. We could even go so, so far as to, uh, to nationalize all the, the businesses uh, that China owns in, in our own country. I mean, that would be, I think that would be a tremendous uh, way to go about doing things to, to retake control of, of, you know, port facilities and farmlands and uh, strategic resources. I mean, here in Utah, we have 70% of food production is owned by, by the Chinese. So, um, I mean, it's just amazing what we've allowed them to do. And, and it's been, you know, such a dereliction of duty. And, and I would argue potentially treasonous on the part of U.S. leaders and uh, administrations uh, to allow that to occur. Well, it's a combination of trees and greed and free trade, free market uh, ideology that led us to this point. Um, there is also a very curious mention uh, by uh, Dr. Pry in one of his last interviews where he was talking about the Russia's performance on the battlefield in Ukraine. And one thing I found very curious and he mentioned it was on the Canadian Prepper uh, YouTube channel. 
And he mentioned that Russia is not fighting with its fist, it's fighting with its fingers. And he's correct. In the reports that I've seen, they are not deploying any of their most advanced weapons, like their Armada tanks, for example, that look like they're from the movie The Terminator, and any of their more sophisticated uh, aircraft and whatnot. What is your take on that? Are the the people that are sympathetic to the Ukrainian side, perhaps understandably or not, are they exaggerating Ukrainian successes? Is the Ukrainians, yes, they have good morale combined with U.S. Uh, defensive weaponry playing a role. But yeah, why is Russia not deploying its most advanced weapons? I just, it's a very hard thing. I, I, I really kind of refuse to believe that the Russians are these totally backward, incompetent people and leaders. I can understand morale is an issue, but what's going on here? Because I respect Dr. Pry, and he's correct. It really made me think they really are not fighting with their fists. They are only fighting with their fingers. More yeah. to your side. I've been saying this for a while, uh, that Russia is is fighting um, with uh, one hand behind its back, essentially, and they've been forced to do so by uh, Putin's policy of engaging in a special military operation versus a full-scale war. Now, with this declaration on September 21st, he's he's overturned that policy, has now uh, fully mobilized uh, the Russian military, uh, reportedly 1.2 million troops, in, in preparation for a final uh, Russian uh, winter counter uh, winter offensive, which is likely to overrun all of Ukraine, or, or at least most of it, and forces capitulation by uh, Russian Victory Day in uh, May, May 9th, uh, 2023. But uh, yeah, it's been very interesting that uh, Putin has been very, um, you know, he hasn't escalated to cyber. He hasn't escalated to EMP or nuclear yet. Um, but we, you know, the more we help help Ukraine succeed on the battlefield, uh, the much higher the, those the chances that he will do so, uh, you know, will, you know, will be. And so uh, we really need to be careful about that. And we need to, you know, try to min minimize that threat. But ultimately, there's no chance of, of Ukrainian victory. Uh, Russia is going to win, and it's going to win in a very big way. We could, it we still have the chance to do a ceasefire. That would be the, the best in the best interests of Ukraine and, and the U.S., of course, and minim, minimizing Russian control of Ukraine. But it's very possible and very likely, I think, that Russia will end up, uh, you know, we're essentially going to be forcing them to overrun Ukraine. And when they do that, uh, the Putin's peace terms are going to be. Uh, pretty maximal, you know, maximalist. He's uh, likely to to call for the annexation of half eastern half of Ukraine. Uh, Western Ukraine may become a Russian um, a Russian proxy state in all but name. I think just because they'll be so dependent on on uh, Russia uh, to, that they'll be forced to pursue a, a pro-Russian policy. Mm. Okay. Well, I know we're running out of time. Uh, Last point, where can people find your newsletters, your papers, articles, et cetera? So, yeah, uh, I would encourage all of your listeners to subscribe. Go to dpyne.substack.com and subscribe to my Real War newsletter for, for the latest updates. We also have uh, the emptaskforce.us, uh, where uh, Dr. Prize and my own um, articles are published. And please volunteer and, and donate to the EMP task force. You know, we, we are in need of, uh, of assistance, both, you know, in terms of volunteers and donations because we are a nonprofit. And lastly, uh, I also have um, a, a number of articles of, on the national interest that I think would be of interest as well. Great. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's been a great interview and uh, hope to have you periodically in the future too, as well. Hopefully, this is another thing we can agree on, uh, along with trade and manufacturing policy. Uh, let's hope we have a future in the next coming months or years. At least we can definitely agree with that. Let's Thank you so Thank much. You. I'm sorry? Thank you. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Thanks again.